All right. Hello, you guys. I think I have everything up and running now. So this is being recorded. If you guys want to, for any reason, want to go back and remember what we said tonight. And for those that can't be there, can be here. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Are there any burning questions that you guys have? Did you guys have a chance to kind of look through the, um, let's see, look through the practice exams, the review questions, uh, anything that we talked about, case studies, uh, open to questions before we get started. If there's no questions, we can just pretty much jump into lecture 11 and 12 and, and just start from the beginning if you guys want. Uh, it's up to you. Anybody have any burning questions right up front? Yes. Hypo and hyperventilation? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we talked about um, one of the differences between increasing respiratory rate, which, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that that's hyper or hypoventilation, right? You could be breathing very shallow and maybe only taking in enough air to uh, ventilate the conducting zone. Remember the conducting zone? There's no gas exchange in the conducting zone. In that case, even though the respiratory rate is high, uh, if you subtract off all the dead space, the conducting zone, then the alveolar ventilation is going to be really low. So you're technically hypoventilating. Okay, so did you just want to talk about what happens to gases with hyper and hypoventilation? Okay, all right. So I always think of the extreme. Hypoventilation, that means that you are not really getting any air into the alveoli. Okay, so a good example of that is holding your breath. That's the extreme, right? Whenever I think of hypoventilation, I automatically think somebody's holding their breath. So what's going to happen to blood gases? Carbon dioxide is going to accumulate. So carbon dioxide levels are going to go up. Oxygen levels are going to go down because the tissues are going to use that oxygen. And if you're not breathing, you're not going to be able to bring oxygen into your body. Okay? So that's hypoventilation. And to really get to the heart of whether you're hypo or hyperventilating, remember you have to subtract off the dead space. So you have to actually calculate al alveolar Ventilation, right? Alveolar ventilation is equal to the tidal volume. Okay, so it was actually a couple different symbols. I'm just going to put the VT, right? Tidal volume minus the dead space volume. Dead space volume. That could include anatomical dead space or alveolar dead space. Remember, when you add those two together, that's physiological dead space. Times respiratory rate. Okay? So again, just for those that aren't here, alveolar ventilation is equal to Tidal volume minus dead space volume times respiratory rate. And I'll just put here physiological dead space is equal to anatomical dead space plus alveolar dead space. So once you determine whether you're hypo or hyperventilating, um, then you can kind of decide what's going to happen to the blood gases. So if you're hypoventilating, you're holding your breath, carbon dioxide levels are going to rise, oxygen levels are going to fall. Yes? When you say anatomical dead space, is that just in the conducting zone? In the conducting zone. And then alveolar is just what's not 
covered by Abbey Older Dead Space? Yeah, so Abbey Older Dead Space is referring to some of the alveoli that might not be getting air because it's either plugged for some reason, you're a smoker, or you have COPD, or uh, you have some kind of maybe blood clot that's not allowing blood to be perfused to an ab a particular alveolar sac or a group of alveoli. Either way, there's no gas exchange in those alveoli. So that would be considered alveolar dead space. Okay. <coughs> yeah? Well, I have a specific question because the, um, the number is on the specific question. Can I just read the question? Okay. Does it have to refer to the PS? Hold on just a second. I just want to finish the question that you had. Hyperventilation on the other side. Hyperventilation is going to lower CO2. You're going to blow off more CO2. So CO2 levels are going to fall and oxygen levels are going to rise with hyperventilation. So that not only includes increasing respiratory rate, but taking in deep breaths. That's technically hyperventilation. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Ask your question. Yeah, so this question number 22. Yep. Okay. Yeah, okay, I know exactly what, yeah. Okay, so the question that she's referring to is on the practice exam. And it's basically asking you, you're a veterinarian and you have intubated a particular patient, a dog. Okay, you have not changed the respiratory rate. Okay, you've not changed the respiratory rate during surgery. So this remains unchanged. Uh, what is going to happen? First of all, this is kind of a two-step process. What happens when you intubate the dog to dead space? What happens to, yeah, somebody said, it, say it again. It increases dead space, yes. So you're going to get an increase in what? The anatomical dead space, right? You increase dead space. What's, what is that going to do to alveolar ventilation then? When you increase the dead space. So just taking a look at this, this equation. If this remains unchanged and tidal volume remains unchanged, as you increase dead space volume, What's going to happen to alveolar ventilation? It's going to decrease, right? Alveolar ventilation is going to decrease. So let me just go through this. If this remains unchanged and you have to subtract off more dead space, this number is going to be smaller. This number it remains unchanged. So that when you multiply these together, alveolar ventilation is going to be smaller. It's going to drop. So technically now you're hypoventilating. What is going to happen now to the blood gases in that dog? So you're going to get a decrease in PO2 and an increase in PCO2. Okay, the partial pressure of oxygen is going to fall. And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to increase. So this, this is key to really kind of figure that question out, that application type problem. You would have to kind of write this out. I would suggest on the exam just write it, you know, the equations out right next to where you're solving the problem. In case there's any kind of confusion, you can always come into my office and we can talk about it. I could give you partial credit if you have all of that written out on the side. Okay, yes. Which equation for when you need it for ventilation? Okay, so um, with minute ventilation and alveolar ventilation, I said in class that you wouldn't be given these, okay? And anything that has to do with Ohm's law. In fact, the practice exam actually has the equation that's going to be attached. Do you want me to bring that up for you guys so that you can see it? Okay, so let's see here. All right. So this is what you'll be given. 
Okay. Oops. Uh, the question with clearance. So you'll be given the clearance equation, filtration fraction, Starling forces, net filtration pressure, law of Laplace, compliance, Poisson's law, and it turns out Graham's law. So the rest of what you don't see there is lung volumes. I'm uh, sorry, lung capacity. Right? You'll have to know how to calculate lung capacity. And the four of them that we talked about was inspiratory capacity, right? The, uh, which is the inspiratory reserve volume plus the tidal volume. We also talked about uh, functional residual capacity, and that is the expiratory reserve volume and the residual volume. Vital capacity is everything that you can measure with a spirometer. It's everything but the residual volume. And then total lung uh, capacity is all of the volumes added up together. So those were the four capacities that we talked about. So you'll have to know how to calculate lung volumes, anything that has to do with Ohm's law, driving force, pressure, gradient is equal to um, minute ventilation times respiratory, or uh, sorry, um, resistance in the lungs. So remember, you're all right on the board. The pressure gradient is going to determine the airflow, right? That's going to be the driving force. And the flow, uh, you could calculate minute ventilation, or sometimes it's, I'll just write it out, minute ventilation. times resistance. And Poisson-Yuse's law kind of breaks down the resistance terms for you. Right here. So minute ventilation is the same thing as flow. Sometimes you guys, I just want to make sure you guys realize that minute ventilation is a flow. Sometimes it's depicted as F. Sometimes it's depicted as Q. It won't be that difficult on the exam. You'll be able to, to deduce. In fact, there really isn't any questions on Ohm's law on the exam. There's some questions about transpulmonary pressure, the definition of transpulmonary pressure, chest wall pressure, respiratory system pressure. And remember, it's the respiratory system pressure, which is the alveolar pressure minus the atmospheric pressure that's determining airflow. Maybe it's easier to go through the slides instead of like me just throwing equations out at you. That might be a little bit too intimidating. So, yes. Filtration, yeah. Um, no, it's just going to be the clearance equation, okay? It's going to be very similar to what's on the practice exam, just so you guys know, okay? So you need to know how to calculate clearance, right? If you calculate clearance for creatinine or inulin, what does that tell you? If you, if you calculate the clearance of creatinine or inulin, what information can you get from that? GFR. You have to know that. I can give you the clearance equation, no problem. I mean, it's a simple mathematical equation. It's, out, it's high school algebra. But you have to know that creatinine, to, calcul to calculate GFR, you have to calculate creatinine or inulin clearance. Okay? Uh, if you calculate clearance, use the clearance equation to calculate clearance for PAH, basically what are you calculating? RPF. 
renal plasma flow. So you can calculate those two variables and then figure out filtration fraction by just dividing GFR over RPF. We're going to keep it simple that way. I'm going to have a screen this entire time. All right. You guys, yes? Yeah. So one of the most important things that you guys need to know is just anatomy first of the urinary system. And then zoom in on each of the kidneys and know the anatomy of the kidney. I'm just going to skip to the ones that are most important. So be able to identify uh, the cortex and the medullary regions. The medulla, it looks like a candy corn, right? Uh, know the renal papilla. And then the minor and major calyx. Calyces is plural. So let me zoom in on this. So here's the minor calyx right here. The larger cavity is the major calyx. And then the renal pelvis is this V shape okay, structure. The ureters, they basically transport that urine to the bladder. And then it's eliminated from the body through the urethra. Yeah. Uh, just the anatomy, just the anatomy. <laughs> we, we're going to concentrate on the nephron and some of the structures in the cortex and medullary region, really. Yeah. All right. This kind of helps you, too. This is a little bit. There we go. All right. Then know the anatomy of the nephron. I think this is probably one of the most important figures. It, you see it over and over again in this entire lecture. It is worth kind of going through because I think at this point you guys have learned a lot of this in a very compartmentalized way, but now it's about putting it all together. Okay, so filtration occurs in the glomerulus. And what's important with filtration? What's determining, uh, what are some of the forces that are important with filtration? Do you guys remember that equation? What's that? Yeah, so that's what we're talking about with net filtration pressure equals the hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries <coughs> minus the hydrostatic pressure in Bowman's space. And then you subtract that difference from the oncotic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. So why don't we put oncotic pressure in Bowman's space in that equation? like we did with the vasculature. Why is that zero? Oncotic pressure in Bowman space. What's that? There shouldn't be any plasma proteins in the ultrafiltrate. 
There shouldn't be any plasma proteins in Bowman space. Okay? Now let's think about it down the road a little bit. 100% of glucose and amino acids are reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. That's why it says 100% nutrients in the proximal tubule. So what should not be in the urine? Glucose, amino acids, and plasma proteins. You shouldn't have any of that in the urine. If you have glucose in the urine, then you probably have diabetes mellitus. Meaning you have so much glucose in the blood, it overwhelms the capacity of the proximal tubule to reabsorb all of the glucose. All right, so filtration. Uh, the reason why the glomerular capillaries are under such high pressure, 60 millimeters of mercury, that is really high, um, is because you need enough pressure difference to, to force this ultrafiltrate through the entire nephron, okay? So you start off with a very high hydrostatic pressure in the glomerular capillaries forces the fluid out into Bowman space, but then there's still enough pressure to make sure all of that ultrafiltrate moves through the entire nephron and then out through the minor calyces, the calyx. Okay. Okay, so remember also, we'll come back to this, there's some dynamic regulation that's occurring between the glomerulus and the distal tubule at tubuloglomerular feedback. So remember there's some dynamic regulation of constriction and dilation of the afferent and efferent arterioles to really regulate flow through that area, okay? Okay, so let's go to the proximal tubule. The thing that you really need to know about the proximal tubule is that this is where most of the reabsorption occurs. Now you guys know reabsorption. Reabsorption means that you're pulling these solutes from the nephron, you're pulling them out of the nephron, delivering them into the interstitial fluid, and then ultimately back into the circulatory system. So what you're doing is you're reabsorbing it back into the body. Most of that happens right here in the proximal tubule. You're recovering most of your essential elements. You need to have the glucose, you need those amino acids, so you're going to reabsorb all of that into the proximal tubule. 85% 85, 85 of bicarbonate is reabsorbed, 70% of sodium and potassium, and 70% of water. All of that is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Okay, so with the thin loops, the descending loops, you can, you can just imagine this as being more passive properties, okay? So diffusion and osmosis is going to occur. Just by passive diffusion and osmosis, you're going to get equilibration of solutes, and because this intermedullary region is so, this is such a hyperosmotic environment, it's going to tend to pull water out. Okay, so water's going to flow out in the descending limb here. And solutes are going to equilibrate. So it's highly permeable to both water and solutes. Here's the key to understanding the kidney, though, the thick ascending. Why is it the key? The thick ascending limb is what's responsible for establishing this osmotic gradient in the medullary region. Okay, so I'll say that again. This thick ascending limb is responsible for setting up this profound osmotic gradient in the medullary region. In the intermedullary region, it can be as high as 1,200 milliosmoles. Up here in the cortex region, it's 300 milliosmoles. So the thick ascending limb with, through active transport mechanisms 
is pulling salts out, but it doesn't allow for water to follow. So you're constantly getting sodium and chloride pulled out of the nephron, delivered into that interstitial fluid, completely surrounds the loop of Henle here. But let me just say this, it's important that the collecting duct is right next to the loop of Henle. Because though that osmotic gradient really has effects on the collecting duct. So this blue part right here, the thick ascending limb, is what's called the diluting segment. You're pulling salts out, but you're not allowing the water to follow. It's establishing that osmotic gradient. Okay, so right here in the distal tubule, that's important because we talked about tubuloblomerular feedback. It basically senses the flow through this area. If the flow is too great, it constricts those afferent arterioles to slow the flow or to, to decrease glomerular filtration rate. Interestingly, we learned this with severe dehydration, if the flow is too slow, it also constricts the afferent arterioles to conserve water. So the flow has to be just right in order to not get any constriction of the afferent arterioles. Okay, so let me ask you a question. If you were talking about the composition of urine, okay, whether you can produce a very dilute urine, what I mean by that is it's high volume, low solutes, right? Not a lot of solutes. That's a dilute urine or a very concentrated urine, which part of the nephron really is responsible for that urine formation, that variability in urine formation, if you had to think about it? It is the collecting duct. Why is that? That's where all the hormonal regulation occurs. So we're talking about vasopressin, aldosterone, all of that regulation is occurring at the back end here, the collecting duct. So because of those hormones, that gives you the ability to either produce a very concentrated urine to conserve water. That urine could be as concentrated as 1,200 milliosmoles or a very dilute urine, high volume, very dilute urine of only 65 milliosmoles. That is a huge range, okay? All of that is happening on the back end. Okay, so that is what's happening at the distal tubule and the collecting duct. Mainly sodium chloride absorption, that's a lot of times mediated through aldosterone. Remember, when you have aldosterone on board, it also promotes potassium secretion. Okay, so that's important. Um, you also, we also talked about uh, protons and bicarbonate. The key to understanding this, and if you go back to the practice exam, I did have a question by email today um, on that particular transport property. Just a rule of thumb, you guys, you can jot this down. For every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate ion is reabsorbed. It doesn't happen the opposite way. So if you have a question that says bicarbonate ions are being secreted, you automatically know that's wrong. Bicarbonate ions are not secreted. Protons are not reabsorbed. The key to understanding this is that protons are secreted and bicarbonate ions are reabsorbed. Yes, you have a question. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Oh, I already answered it. Okay, great. Okay, so for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. 
Okay, if you have a person that, like Molly, you guys remember that case study, the little girl that overdosed on aspirin? That was a metabolic acidosis that she was suffering from. Um, in that case, she would also have enhanced glutamine transport into those cells of the collecting duct. With enhanced glutamine, let me just go to that. It forms ammonium ions. Oops, I wonder if it's in this one. I don't think it's in this one. That's the transport properties. It's probably this one. Yep. So do you guys remember these? Okay, so for every carbon dioxide molecule, one proton is secreted and one bicarbonate is reabsorbed. If there is sufficient enough bicarbonate that's secreted into the nephron, this is the tubular lumen, then it will um, recover all of the bicarbonate, the filtered bicarbonate, that's not reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So there is a reaction in the nephron to convert that back to carbon dioxide. Oops, back to carbon dioxide. And then carbon dioxide actually can be just by passive diffusion be reabsorbed back into the body. So this is a way to recover all of your buffer, the necessary buffer, to keep your pH pretty much at homeostasis, right? You don't want to lose a lot of your buffer. Uh, especially if you're usually secreting. I mean, on a day-to-day -day basis with cellular respiration, we're usually generating way more acid. And we're always trying to manage that acid load. So usually we secrete these protons and we can recover all of our filtered bicarbonate. Okay. Now, when we recover all of our bicarbonate, then we can start, to, this. these protons can start uh, binding to phosphates and then you basically are generating new bicarbonate ions and you can just get rid of that excess acid this is a way to just get rid of all that acid okay now here's what I was talking about with glutamine if you have an acidosis like Molly you're going to enhance this glutamine transport on both the apical and basal lateral membrane that's going to increase the amount of glutamine generating ammonium ions, which are secreted and excreted. And again, this generates new buffer, new bicarbonate. So you're actually enhancing your buffer system in your blood now, too. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes. Myogenic regulation? Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see here. That's in this lecture. All right. Um, going back to lecture, do you guys have any questions about this particular slide here? You guys pretty good with this now? It's an important one. If you guys need some text associated with it, this is pretty good. Um, I would say go over this particular slide too. Just make sure that you know what's going to happen to glomerular filtration rate if you constrict either the afferent or efferent arterioles or you dilate either the efferent, afferent or efferent arterioles. And then this is another one. Please take a look at this one. I want you guys to definitely know the difference between reabsorption and secretion. So the four different processes are filtration, reabsorption, secretion, and excretion. Okay, just like the practice exam, you can I can guarantee there's going to be one question just like this. Okay. So which one of these is filtered, reabsorbed, and excreted? Is it A, B, or C? It's B, right? It's this one. Filtered, reabsorbed, and excreted. 
Did I say excreted? Yeah, okay. All right, so just make sure you know how to think about that. Okay, I would also go through these transport. You had a question. Okay, what's the difference? The question is, what's the difference between secretion and excretion? Okay, so going back, whenever you transport molecules from the blood into the nephron, that would be secretion. Okay, excretion is really elimination from the body. Okay, so that's micturition or urination. Anytime you get rid of those elements from your body, that's excretion. Yep. Um, I think that we went through this in, in pretty much a lot of detail. I would say the, the main idea here is with the proximal tubule to identify those sodium glucose or sodium amino acid transporters. Right? Now that you know that the proximal tubule is all about recovering all those nutrients, you, if you saw this on the apical membrane here, you could say, oh yeah, that's the proximal tubule. This is also really important. If you saw the NKCC co-transporter on the apical membrane, you should be able to identify that right away as the thick ascending limb. This is where all of those salts are reabsorbed, but water is not allowed to follow. And then finally, this one is in the collecting duct. This is where amylaride works, right on this ENAC channel, epithelial sodium channel. Okay, so let me get to your question now. I think, I think those are great questions. Uh, let's go to myogenic regulation yes so the question was she wanted to go through the intrinsic mechanisms myogenic tubuloglomerular feedback and mesangeal cells okay so I had a lot of questions after class on this one whoa there we go if you guys have this slide available, let me just tell you kind of what to do to read it. Because there's some real differences between myogenic regulation and tubuloglomerular feedback. So in this case, with myogenic regulation, I would put one big arrow down the left side of it and just put one, number one with a circle around it. So you would read this graph down first, and then you would read it down this way, and I would put a number two, okay? So it's read down this way first, and then uh, across to the right, and then down. Just remember, myogenic regulation is happening before filtration. Myogenic regulation is happening before filtration. So in this case, let's read it. You get a surge of high blood pressure, an increase in mean arterial pressure. What happens is that increases the afferent arteriolar pressure, the glomerular capillary pressure. It increases glomerular filtration pressure and glomerular filtration rate. Okay, that's what happens with a surge of high blood pressure. However, the compensatory mechanism to try to get that flow back in homeostatic range is this. That stretch of the afferent arteriolar smooth muscle is going to activate those or stimulate those stretch receptors and there's going to be a compensatory constriction of those smooth muscle cells around those afferent arterioles. Okay? That's to get the flow back into normal ranges. This is happening before glomerular filtration. Okay? Does that make sense? So as soon as those afferent arterioles detect stretch of this high blood pressure, there's going to be a compensatory constriction, right? Right? 
constriction of the afferent arterioles, resistance goes up of the afferent arterioles, glomerular capillary pressure falls, glomerular filtration pressure falls, and glomerular filtration rate gets back to normal. Okay? So what you would do is read with myogenic regulation down first, down the left-hand side, and then, so I would put a little one here, and then two would be an arrow that would go to the right and then down. You put a little two. Okay? All of that, again, is happening before filtration. Tubuloglomerular feedback is happening after filtration. Okay? So what's being sensed here is the flow through the distal tubule in the nephron. In this case, you can read this flow chart in a counterclockwise way. Read it counterclockwise. So you get this surge of high blood pressure, increase in mean arterial pressure, increase in afferent arteriolar pressure, increase in glomerular capillary pressure, glomerular filtration pressure, and increase in glomerular filtration rate, just like before, right? But what's going to happen now is you get an increase in the flow by those macula densa cells. They're sensing that flow in the distal tubule. They're the cells that are sensing the flow. They're going to send a chemical, it just says chemical signal. But basically it sends a signal to constrict the afferent arterioles. You get an increase in resistance and a decrease in glomerular capillary pressure. So, about the macula densa cells, what you might not have put all together yet is that if the flow is too great, like we see here, there's going to be a constriction of those afferent arterioles to regulate the flow, to get the flow back into, again, normal range. However, what we learned with severe dehydration is that if the flow is too slow as well, it's also going to be sensed and there's going to be a constriction of the afferent arterioles so that you can conserve water. If you don't filter that fluid, right, if you really decrease glomerular filtration rate, then you won't lose it to your environment. So in severe de so the idea here is that if the slow if the flow is too great or too slow, you're going to get constriction of the afferent All right, so that's what's called tubuloglomerular feedback. And just so you guys remember this too, I think this says it all. This graph right here in the upper left-hand corner, you can, have a blood, you can have blood pressure between 80 millimeters of mercury and 180 millimeters of mercury. That is really high blood pressure. And you can still have a very constant glomerular filtration rate because of that auto-regulation, right? That's amazing. That's really incredible, okay? It's not until you get above 180 where you basically start to, what I call, blow out the glomerulus. The pressure is so high that you start to really, um, the integrity of the filtration system is basically blown out. And that's why you get this rise in glomerular filtration rate. And that's when you start losing blood proteins, right, plasma proteins and things like that. So that's not good. That's when you get scar tissue and kidney disease. And that's why heart disease and kidney disease go hand in hand. Okay? All right. So uh, the last one was the mesangeal cells. With the mesangeal cells, basically what they're doing is also detecting flow. Let me find here. They control blood pressure and filtration within the glomerulus. They basically can control the podocytes, the filtration slits, but they can actually cause these mesangeal loops as well. So they basically cut off part of the glomerular capillaries and they reduce the surface area so you don't get as much filtration as well. So there's some, again, tubuloglomerular feedback that signals these mesangeal cells. This is all part of the autoregulation. And the same idea if the blood pressure is too high, 
then it's going to lower the flow and the glomerular filtration rate to keep it all in, uh, in normal ranges, okay? All right. So let me just finish up. These are the mesangeal cells. These are actually called the extra uh, glomerular because they're outside the glomerulus, extra glomerular mesangeal cells. They produce those loops. And then the intraglomerular mesangeal cells control the filtration slits. Okay. All right, so that's the intrinsic mechanisms, okay? Meaning that they are all, they all originate within the region, right? They're all paracrine responses. Extrinsic mechanisms are uh, signals from the outside of the kidney, and that includes Neurogenic or hormones, the endocrine system. Yeah. Do you have a question? The constriction of the afferent arterial will decrease the glomerular capillary pressure. Yes. And then that's going to decrease ultimately glomerular filtration rate. Yes. So I'm glad you guys are starting to put all of it together. It's a lot of information. It all kind of, there's a logic to it. Right? But it is a lot of detail with this one. Okay, so we can actually finish up the kidney, surprisingly. I think that you guys are really kind of already putting everything together by talking about the extrinsic mechanisms. Okay? And that includes regulation by vasopressin. These are the only ones that I'm going to have you know for the exam. Vasopressin, aldosterone, the renin-angiotensin system, it's actually renin-angiotensin-aldosterone, and then finally atrial natriuretic peptide. So which one of these are not like the others? Which one of these four are not like the others? A and P, why? It's a diuretic. So vasopressin, aldosterone, Renin angiotensin aldosterone are, they are all uh, anti diuretics. Anti diuretics, which means they promote a very hyper osmotic urine, a very concentrated urine. A diuretic, like, ooh, did I lose this? I think I did. Did I completely lose this? <laughs> yeah. Um, so AMP is the only anti, or I'm sorry, the only diuretic, and it produces a very hypoosmotic urine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, vasopressin, aldosterone, and Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, they're all antidiuretics. They allow you to concentrate urine. So what you do is you produce a very hyperosmotic uh, urine. ANP, or atrial natriuretic peptide, is the only diuretic. And that promotes a very hypoosmotic urine hypoosmotic, which is a very dilute urine. So AMP is Lasix? Uh, no. Uh, AMP is atrial natriuretic peptide. Lasix is a NKCC, sodium potassium 2-chloride cotransporter inhibitor. Also a very powerful diuretic. Yep. Okay. I wonder if I have some extra batteries. Hold on. Might have some batteries here. Okay. You can think about your questions. There we go. Sweet.
you guys hear me in the back now? Okay. Do you guys have any questions about that? All right, so let's talk about vasopressin. You guys already did that severe dehydration worksheet, right? So what is sensing the high osmolarity in the blood? Where is it? Where is it being sensed? High osmolarity. Yes. Um, that's detecting, yeah, let me think about that. That's detecting pressure, the barrel receptor. So whenever you guys see the term barrel, that's pressure. These are osmoreceptors. Yeah, hypothalamus. Okay, osmoreceptors are in the hypothalamus. Okay, so they're detecting the high osmolarity, the increase in osmolarity. You're going to promote a profound thirst behavior. We already did this yesterday. This is a good review. Um, and then you're also going to secrete vasopressin, which is also called antidiuretic hormone, from the posterior pituitary. That travels to the kidney where it binds to its receptor. It's a GS-coupled receptor. You guys didn't remember that? What does, what does it do once that GS pathway is stimulated? What's the end result? Insertion of aquaporin channels, water channels. That allows you to reabsorb water. Here's the key, you guys. Here's the key. You know, you insert these water channels, but what is moving the water? from the nephron into the interstitial fluid. Just because you insert water channels doesn't mean you're gonna move water. That just gives you a pathway. What's that? Do you have channels in the water columns? Uh, well, yes. Yeah, that does set up an osmotic gradient. But I'm thinking of just something simple. Why can you move? Why is it possible to move water from inside the nephron to outside? This is what I think sometimes is missing. Okay, so if this is the collecting duct, can you guys see that all right or do I need to turn on the light? You can see that all right? If this is the collecting duct, and as you move from the cortex region into the inner medullary region, remember this is a very hyper osmotic environment. And that's set up by the loop of Henle right next door. So what is responsible for moving the water from inside the nephron to the interstitial fluid, reabsorbing the water? Just because you insert the channels doesn't mean that water's going to flow out. Pressure gradient, back to Ohm's law. Osmosis, right? So now when you look at this picture, I want you to see that this is high water molecules inside, high water molecule concentration inside, and low water molecule concentration outside. That's the driving force. Okay, so water is going to be pulled out of the nephron, especially in that inner medullary region. Okay, just because you insert those channels doesn't mean you're automatically going to flow through. You have to have a driving force. Why do diuretics work? Why do diuretics work? Because diuretics a lot of times work because they inhibit the reabsorption. This is to your comment, if you inhibit the reabsorption of some of the solutes, the solutes stay inside the nephron, and now they start to disrupt the osmotic driving force. Do you understand that? So if you increase the amount of solute inside the nephron, you're going to lower the osmotic driving force for the movement of water out. 
you're not going to be able to move as much water out. So you're going to lose, that's what a lot of times diuretics do, you lose a lot of solute, but you also lose a lot of fluid. Lasix works that way. Amylaride works that way. So if you inhibit the NKCC co-transporter and you deliver all of the solute into the collecting duct, it diminishes that osmotic driving force. It can't pull as much water out. So you lose a lot of that water and solute. Amylaride works on that ENAC channel that aldosterone just put in. And so if you block that, you don't get sodium reabsorption. All of that stays inside the nephron and you can't pull as much water out. That's why it's also a potassium sparing diuretic. Okay, that sounds, I see a lot of people like now deer in the headlights. Ha! Do you guys kind of understand that? When you didn't have all this solute in here, okay, so let's talk about, let's talk about Lasix for a minute. Just for a minute, I'm gonna pull up the screen and video mute this. I wanna get to the respiratory stuff, so we have a full hour to do that too. One of the first lines of defense, you can ask your dad or anybody you know that has high blood pressure, first line of defense, diuretics, right? Get rid of that excess body, body, bodily fluid, that volume, so that you lower blood pressure, okay? One of the first lines of defense. Okay, <laughs> now I have to put the screen all the way back down. <laughs> Jeez. All right. So, vasopressin, let me ask you some questions while it's coming down. If you have a head injury and you 
instead of an anti-gyrus, now it starts acting as a gyrus. So you lose a lot of fluid, always thirsty, probably dehydrated. What is that called? If you guys remember, I'll be impressed if anybody remembers this disorder. Diabetes mellitus. Diabetes mellitus. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, there is, so it originates in the brain. It's actually necrogenic. I'm sorry, neurogenic. Neurogenic diabetes mutator. Or sometimes called central diabetes mutator. Neuro, referring to the hypothalamus. Genic means origin. Neurogenic diabetes mutator. So if it's a problem with the the receptor itself, that would be nephrogenic. Nephro meaning nephron, nephrogenic diabetes mutator. Okay, aldosterone. Anybody have any questions on aldosterone? Let me go back to the screen here. All right. There are a couple questions on countercurrent multiplier versus countercurrent uh, exchanger. Okay, the loop of Henle is what? Countercurrent multiplier or countercurrent exchanger? Multiplier, because it uses active transport mechanisms to set up that osmotic gradient. It's in a U-shaped in a U shape and it actually uses that formation to set up that osmotic gradient. But it, but it has to have active transport mechanisms to be considered a countercurrent multiplier. The vasorecta is a countercurrent exchanger because it only uh, uh, relies on passive transport properties. You guys know the difference? Vasorecta only relies on passive transport properties, which include simple diffusion and osmosis. So make sure you guys know how to think about that. Here's a nice figure of vasopressin. Yeah. Yep. And the vasorecta yep. is the exchanger. Mm -hmm. the vasorecta is the dotting dog. Yeah, so let me get to a really, here. This is the perfect graph to look at. The nephron is on the left-hand side. The vasorecta is the blood supply. It's on the right. So they are distinct. This one is considered a countercurrent multiplier because it basically relies on active transport properties to pull salt out and establish that osmotic gradient. The vasorecta, though, like this one, this is uh, kind of blowing up this part. This is relying exclusively on just passive diffusion and osmosis. And it's just because they're right next to each other, the descending limb and the ascending limb, that you can have this countercurrent exchanger. That's the only reason why it's possible. So water is basically pulled out in the descending limb and then brought back in in the ascending limb. Solutes is the opposite. Solutes are actually going into the blood uh, in the descending limb and then being forced out just by diffusion on the ascending limb. Okay, so just by those passive properties, why is that important? A lot of students are like, why do that? It seems so complicated. But what it's doing is it's allowing blood to go to the epithelial cells, even at the bottom of the loop of Henle, and give them nutrients and oxygen uh, without eroding the osmotic gradient that was established by the loop of Henle. Okay, so you, you need blood to be delivered to those epithelial cells, even at the bottom of the loop of Henle. But you don't want to erode it away. If it was actually organized in a linear fashion like this, salts would be constantly moved into the blood 
but then it would be washed away. You wouldn't be able to maintain the osmotic gradient that was established by the loop of Henry. Okay? So it's organized in a U shape like this so that you can deliver blood, you can deliver oxygen and nutrients without disrupting the osmotic gradient that's established by the loop of Henle. Okay, so are we good with um, aldosterone? Aldosterone inserts these ENAC channels right here, this sodium, enhances sodium transport into the cell and out across the basal lateral membrane via these pumps that enhances potassium secretion as a result. So as you add more sodium channels, it revs up the pump so that you bring in more potassium and the ultimate result is more potassium secretion with aldosterone. So aldosterone not only uh, is responsible for enhanced sodium chloride reabsorption, it's also responsible for enhanced potassium secretion. And with all of that sodium chloride being reabsorbed, that's the, the net movement of solute is from the tubular lumen, the inside of the nephron, to the blood. Water should follow that, that massive salt movement, that sodium chloride movement. But only if vasopressin is on board, right? Were you going to ask that? No, um, just it's responsible for more potassium secretion. Too. Yeah, so you do have potassium moving in the opposite direction, but the net solute movement is reabsorption and water's going to follow that solute movement. Yep. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so let's get to renin angiotensin. It's important to know this cascade. This renin is actually secreted in the face of low blood pressure, like our severe dehydration worksheet. The baroreceptors in the juxt by the juxtaglomerular cells in the carotid and aortic arch, all of those are actually triggering the juxtaglomerular cells uh, to release renin. And renin is an enzyme that actually converts angiotensinogen from the liver. It's the liver that produces angiotensinogen. Renin converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. And then angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2 by ACE, which is uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. It's housed in these endothelial cells. And then angiotensin II does a couple of different things. Angiotensin, the name, angiotensin, suggests that there's vasoconstriction, an increase in total peripheral resistance as a result. Right? It's going to increase that resistance, increasing mean arterial pressure. But it also has effects on aldosterone, which promotes sodium chloride reabsorption and water reabsorption. All of those together increase blood pressure. And then all you really have to remember with the last one, which is a diuretic, atrial natriuretic peptide, is that it acts as a diuretic because it inhibits vasopressin, it inhibits aldosterone, and it inhibits the renin angiotensin system. So it basically just shuts everything off, and then it is basically acting as a diuretic. Okay, you guys good with that? All right, let's go ahead and start with the respiratory system. Okay, so I want to make sure that we get to some of the harder, difficult concepts. All right? So I think you guys have probably a pretty good handle 
Let me know if you want me to slow down, okay? Um, but I think that you guys probably have a pretty good handle on the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. Just like the practice exam, just make sure you know where the conducting zone is and where the respiratory zone is. The bronchi, bronchioles, and terminal bronchioles, that all makes up the conducting zone. Now remember, this is the, this part here, conducting zone. No gas exchange or hardly any gas exchange is occurring in the conducting zone. And that is considered anatomical dead space. Anatomical dead space. The respiratory zone is where all the gas exchange is occurring at the respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs. So there's a very rich blood supply around these structures. Okay, did you what? Did you take that picture? Okay. All right. I think you guys know how to calculate minute ventilation, alveolar ventilation. We went through that in the very beginning. Know your lung volumes. Uh, the one, the capacities that you need to know are the functional residual capacity, vital capacity, total lung capacity, and the inspiratory capacity. You don't need to remember the expiratory reserve, or uh, the, oh no, you don't have it on here. Sometimes people um, actually calculate the expiratory capacity too, but that's, I'd rather you guys know the functional residual capacity. Okay, surfactant, remember it's the alveolar type 2 cells that secrete surfactant. Let me see if I can find that here. Here's the alveolar type 2 cells that secrete surfactant. That's the main thing with those alveolar type 2 cells. Surfactant, I think this is a good table to go from. Pulmonary surfactant is a mixture of phospholipids and protein. It's secreted by those alveolar type 2. It lowers the surface tension, specifically in the smaller alveoli. Okay, so it lowers the lung compliance, making them more stretchable. Surface tension is smaller in the lower alve uh, alveoli, stabilizing the alveoli so that you don't get alveolar collapse. And this is really important in fetal lung, especially preemies that are born too early. The problem is that they're not secreting surfactant yet. So the whole idea here is the law of Laplace. The law of Laplace says that pressure is equal to 2 times the surface tension over radius. So when you look at the left-hand side where there's no surfactant, you can see the radii are very different. The radius in A is a lot larger than the radius in B. Um, and when there's no surfactant on board, when the surface tensions are equal to each other because there's no surfactant, the law of Laplace dictates that the pressure in A is going to be less than the pressure in B. So the pressure in the larger alveoli is going to be less than the pressure in B, the smaller alveoli. Air is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure. And then what tends to happen is what's called alveolar collapse. Okay? So in the absence of surfactant, the attraction between water molecules can cause alveolar collapse. Surfactant, when it's secreted, has more of an effect on the smaller alveoli. So what that does is it actually lowers the surface tension in B more than it does in A. It lowers the surface tension in B more than it does in A, which equalizes the pressure and prevents alveolar collapse. Okay? So that's the importance of surfactant. So what you have to remember with like our top hat questions, it lowers 
surface tension in smaller alveoli in particular, increasing compliance. So that was one of our top hat questions. It would be A, decreased surface tension and effectively increasing compliance. All right, so let's go ahead and go. I think that it's pretty easy to understand ventilation, right? Ventilation is simply where negative pressure breathers. The rest, oh, you have a question, sorry. How does surface tension affect the pressure? Uh, let's see here. Surface tension basically affects the lung compliance, the stretchability of the lung. Um, I would, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> I can't even think of a good answer for that other than looking at the law of Laplace where pressure is equal to surface tension over the radius. Um, somehow that air-liquid interface and the compliance issues will, if you increase that surface tension, you're going to increase that pressure if the radii are the same. So I don't have a good answer for you, <laughs> especially this late at night. But let me look into it. That won't be on your exam, okay? I just go by the equation. Pressure is equal to two surface tension over radius. Um, I would think that part of it would be the stretchability and the amount, like volume Boyle's law. That's one thing to think about too, is uh, the gas loss. When you increase a uh, compartment, the volume, what happens to the pressure? If you increase uh, uh, the volume of a compartment, what happens to the pressure? it goes down, right? Boyle's Law, there's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume. Um, I, would say, I would think that that would be part of it too, the law of Laplace. But that kind of uh, goes with what we're saying here. As negative pressure breathers, what happens when you, you stimulate those neurons to those intercostal muscles, that it's actually the external intercostal muscles these external intercostal muscles right here are stimulated. That pulls the chest wall out, um, basically opening up the lungs, dropping the pressure in the alveoli. Air is always going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, so it pulls air in. OK, so let me ask you a question. Why, when you pull out the chest wall, why do the lungs open? And I want you to think about it in terms of the pleural membranes. Why is it possible that when you pull out the chest wall, the lung actually follows? The lung's also pulled open. It really has everything to do with that fluid in between the two pleural membranes. Remember I told you it acts as a buffer? So you can move the pleural membranes really easily up and down like this, like microscope slides with a little bit of fluid in between. But if you try to pull them apart, it's almost impossible. So when the chest wall uh, is pulled out, the lungs actually go with it, right? Because it's almost impossible to pull them apart. Okay, so that's an interesting kind of dynamic too. Okay, so you should think about that too. So. Chest wall gets pulled out, lungs get pulled open, all of the volume in the lungs increase, pressure drops, right? Air is forced into the lungs. The opposite is true with exhalation. Rib cage goes back to normal, normal position. Uh, all the volume in the lungs decrease, pressure in the alveoli increase, then pressure is forced out of the body, okay? So with this slide, the take-home message here is don't, don't memorize all of these different numbers and what happens with inhalation, exhalation. Please take a look at the top where we have, uh, let me blow this up so you can see it, the definitions. Okay. So we blow this up. Oh, it's a little too much. Okay. Oops. Oops. 
transpulmonary pressure is the pressure difference holding the lungs open. Okay, so here's the, the transpulmonary pressure right here. It's basically opposing that elastic recoil. So the transpulmonary pressure is the pressure holding the lungs open. As you inhale, that transpulmonary pressure increases, which really is responsible for opening the lungs. Chest wall pressure is the difference between the uh, interpleural pressure and the atmospheric pressure, and it's basically the pressure that's holding the chest wall in. And then the respiratory system pressure is basically that pressure that's determining airflow. It's alveolar pressure minus atmospheric pressure. Alveolar pressure minus atmospheric pressure is the respiratory system pressure. Okay, so then we actually went into the gas laws, Boyle's law, inverse relationship between uh, volume and pressure. As you increase volume, you decrease pressure. If you decrease volume, you increase pressure. Because basically it's all about the number of collisions within that compartment. Right. So in this case, when you increase the volume, you diminish the number of the collisions of these molecules. So that decreases pressure. All right. So here's what we were talking about before, too. Driving force over resistance is equal to flow. So remember, this is actually the respiratory system pressure, which is alveolar pressure minus atmospheric pressure. And that's the pressure gradient, the driving force. So that's going to determine flow. This is just Ohm's law. Now we can further define resistance, right? This is Poisson-Yeux's law. We had this in exam two, so this is just review. But it does apply to uh, bronchoconstriction just as well as it does vasoconstriction in the cardiovascular. So let me bump this down. What this is saying is that small changes in the radius of some of those bronchioles, small changes in the radius translates to huge difference in resistance. So just a tiny bit of bronchoconstriction can really have profound effects on resistance because of this R to the fourth power, right? That's the take home pet message with Plus, I use this law. Small changes in the radius of the tube translates to huge differences in resistance. Okay, so let's go to compliance real quick. The blue line is giving you an idea of what's happening with emphysema. If the green line is normal, this is what happens with high compliance. You only need to have a very small transpulmonary pressure, right? This is the x-axis. Very small transpulmonary pressure difference to make huge changes in lung volume. That's very high compliance. The stretchability of the lungs is great. However, it's not always a good thing. It's the difference between blowing into a balloon, where you have that elastic recoil, and blowing into a Ziploc baggie. You can blow easily into the Ziploc baggie, right, and blow it up, but there's no elastic recoil. So individuals have to really use their abdominal muscles, they even use part of their scapula to really get force the air out. It's really a problem not getting air in, Stretchability, it's easy to get blown, uh, air in. It's really for people that have emphysema, it's getting that air out. They've lost that elastic recoil. What they've, what's happened is they've lost the elastin, that elastic recoil that helps to get the air out. With those individuals too, because they've compromised that transpulmonary pressure too, 
the chest wall actually bows out. They have a signature barrel chest as a result of, the, of emphysema. Um, with decreased compliance, that would be an example of that would be cystic fibrosis, okay, where it takes huge changes in the transpulmonary pressure to make very small changes in lung volume. It's really hard work to open up the lungs and get air in with cystic fibrosis. This is also true, I'm just going to put some things together, of babies that are born prematurely that aren't able to produce surfactants. Okay, that makes sense, right? If you're not able to produce surfactant, ultimately you have very low compliance, and that does affect the lung as a whole too. So they have decreased compliance as a result of the lack of surfactant. Okay, pneumothorax, you guys remember this one? Uh, the difference between an open and closed pneumothorax. An open pneumothorax is a breach of the parietal pleura. The parietal pleura is the one on the outside. The visceral pleura is the one on the inside. Okay. So if you breach the parietal pleura and you have this open sucking chest wound, what's happening is every time you breathe in, your thoracic cage expands and you're going to pull air in from the path of least resistance. It's going to go through that wound is what's going to happen. It's going to get caught up in that intrapleural space and the lung is going to get, as you accumulate air, in this space right here, in the pleural sac, it's going to force the lungs into a tiny ball. That's what happens with collapsed lung. Okay? One way to rectify that is, again, to put a piece of plastic, tape it on three sides, acts as a one-way valve, so that when you breathe in, it shuts off. You can't get air into your pleural sac. But then when you breathe out, it actually allows for air to escape. So one way to rectify that. Um, it also occurs a closed pneumothorax is when you have like emphysema and there's a breach of the visceral pleura. This can happen when you're diving and you hold your breath as you're coming up from depth, right? Your lungs expand as you come up from depth and you can blow, you can basically get a breach between the lung and the pleural sac. So then air starts to accumulate in the pleural sac, and again, it can cause a collapsed lung. Again, I also use the uh, example of driving along and then maybe hitting a tree. Most people go, <gasps> and then the steering wheel hits them, right? Boom, that forces the air from inside your lungs into the pleural space, okay? Also, that can cause a collapsed lung. <laughs> Those would be a breach of the visceral pleura. So the idea here is know the difference between visceral pleura, that's the pleura that's right next to the lung, and the outer membrane, which is the parietal pleura. Okay? So know the difference between those two. Okay, we talked about the lung volumes. Do you guys want me to go through the lung volumes or you're pretty good with that? Okay, go through them? Okay. Um, I usually like to go from this. There's four lung volumes, four lung capacities. Tidal volume is the volume of air that you just normally breathe in with a normal breath. It's about 500 mils with an average male, about 70 kilograms, which is about 165 pounds. That would be the tidal volume. After a normal inhalation, right, you're at the top here. Everything that you can breathe on top of that, a maximum inspiration, this would be the inspiratory reserve volume. So after a normal inhalation, everything you can breathe into your lungs, this is called the inspiratory reserve volume. It's about 3,000 mils or 3 liters. After a normal exhalation, now you're down here where this arrow is, everything that you can breathe out of your lungs is called the expiratory reserve volume. 
but you still have air left over in your lungs, helps to keep your lungs from collapsing. That'd be horrible. Every time we breathe out completely that if our lungs collapsed. So you have what's called a residual volume. The only way you can measure that, because you can't measure that on a spirometer, is by estimating that with a calculation. How tall you are, what gender you are, how, what, how much do you weigh. Or you could, like I said, stick a vacuum cleaner down your mouth and suck out all that air and then measure it. But that would be excruciating. All right, so that the, the, after a maximal exhalation, everything left in your lung is called the residual volume. So here are the four lung capacities that I want you guys to know. Inspiratory capacity, can you see that all right? I can blow that up. Maybe I can't. There you go. Whoops. Okay. Can't be. There we go. Um, inspiratory capacity is the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve volume. Vital capacity is everything that you can measure with a spirometer, so it's everything but the residual volume. The functional residual capacity, I think that's what everybody forgets to study. That is the expiratory reserve volume. That's this volume right here, expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. That's the functional residual capacity. And then total lung capacity is everything put together. Okay. All right. We've already discussed what the difference is between minute ventilation is and alveolar ventilation. And we talked about hypo and hyperventilation. I can stay after if anybody is really wanting to know that. We also talked about this already. That was your question about what happens to the gases with hyper and hypoventilation. Um, let's go ahead. We only have about 25 minutes left. Uh, you guys are good with the gas laws. The gas laws that you'll need to know is Boyle's law, Dalton's law, yes. Yeah, so um, it gave you a little extra information, uh, but I would just pull out the atmospheric pressure. So it was 450, and that's the only thing that you really need to know. Yeah, uh, it's probably giving you some statistic that you don't need. So it would be 450, let's see which one is that, 450, and then you would subtract off, if it's asking for the dry gas, then you would go ahead and subtract off 47. So this will be 450 millimeters of mercury at the top of Pike's Peak, minus 47 millimeters of mercury. And then you would multiply that by, um, this was for oxygen? Yep, so you'd multiply that by 21, uh, 0.21 or 21%. Why do you subtract that off? Because you want to subtract off the water vapor pressure just to get the dry gas partial pressure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then we talked about Fick's law. You guys are very familiar with Fick's law. Henry's law is really important. So just know with Henry's law, 
that concentration equals the partial pressure of that gas times solubility. And this is important uh, because I, I gave you an example of, well, the into thin air is a perfect example. You probably noticed that carbon dioxide levels were pretty much normal with this guy. But there was a real problem with uh, the difference between the alveolar pressure inside the lungs, inside the alveoli, and the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. There was a huge drop between partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and partial pressure of, of oxygen in the arterial, in the artery. Why was that? Why was that? Do you guys remember? It's like having pneumonia. He had edema. So he had an accumulation of fluid. Because carbon dioxide is more soluble in fluid, <coughs> carbon dioxide levels were normal. Carbon dioxide could move across that increased fluid layer easier than oxygen. But this guy, was had, he had what's called pulmonary edema, high altitude pulmonary edema, meaning he had fluid accumulating in his alveoli sacs. So it really compromised his ability to diffuse oxygen from the alveoli into the artery. Carbon dioxide, again, wasn't affected because it's very soluble. It can just move across that layer easily. So that's why this is an important concept here. And Graham's law, which is on the back of your exam, is just a combination between Graham's law and Fick's law. It basically is, instead of the concentration gradient that you remember with Fick's law, concentration gradient, instead of concentration, just substitute partial pressure and solubility. So that's what basically Graham's law is all about. It's just saying that the diffusion rate is proportional instead of concentration to the partial pressure of that gas times the solubility of that gas. Okay, that's, the, that's really the take home message with Graham's law. Okay. okay, so 20 minutes left. I think there was a ton of questions on oxygen dissociation curves. I had a ton of questions on that yesterday after class. So let's go ahead and go to 15. I think that's the main thing that I want to cover. OK, first of all, are you guys pretty comfortable with reading this oxygen dissociation curve and knowing how to understand partial, the P50 value? Remember with P50, you actually identify where the 50% saturation point is. What that means is that with all of the oxygen binding sites on all of the hemoglobin, 50% have oxygen attached and 50% of those oxygen binding sites don't. That would be the 50% saturation point. And then you just read over and then read down to where that partial pressure of oxygen is. That's how you would calculate partial pressure. So let's, the P50. OK, so let's talk about Boyle's law first. But before I do that, I want to make sure that everybody can understand this graph in some ways. The partial pressure of oxygen on the x-axis is measuring what? That seems like an obvious question, but what is it actually measuring? What, what are we looking at when we're looking at the x-axis? What is it? Uh, not the oxygen affinity to hemoglobin. That's where this is tricky. When we're talking about partial pressure of oxygen, what are we talking about? The oxygen that can bind, but where is it? In the blood, in the plasma. It's dissolved oxygen. It's the soluble oxygen. Does that make sense to you guys? 
This is the dissolved oxygen in blood. It has nothing to do with hemoglobin. Right. So you can see how the dissolved oxygen has a on how much oxygen can be found in hemoglobin. So when you're at 100 millimeters of mercury, that would tell you that almost all of the binding sites have of hemoglobin have ox all those oxygen binding sites have an oxygen molecule attached. But at 40 millimeters of mercury, you can see that there's a real difference, right? With the lowest pH, only 60% saturation. Only 60% of all of those oxygen binding sites on the hemoglobin molecule have an oxygen attached to it. Does that make more sense? This is giving you information about soluble or dissolved oxygen in the blood. This is telling you how much oxygen is attached to hemoglobin. So this is really a relationship between the two. Yes? So if you Oh, that's a good question. Yes, yes, yes. You would increase the oxygen carrying capacity. So you would increase, now this is normalized to 100%. So you would affect this graph, right? Because this is just telling you 100%, whether it's 100% of 100 binding sites or 100% of 200. Right? The percent would not change. Okay? But if you're actually looking at total oxygen content, then that's definitely going to change. Okay? So there's some graphs that look at total oxygen content, not just percent. So that represented 50 to the body size. Yeah. You mean longer this yeah. way? Yeah. No, I, I would think that even at 100 millimeters of mercury, you would still get a very significant amount. Okay, the, the example would be high altitude, right? That's why athletes train at high altitude to increase the red blood cell and hemoglobin count. But they still are getting 100% saturation at 100 millimeters of mercury, whether they have twice the amount of red blood cells or not, okay? Yeah. But if this y-axis was total oxygen content, it would be double. It would be, you're talking about the saturation level, okay? We can, we can talk more about that after class, too. Yes. Okay, so remember, this is the relationship of dissolved oxygen to how much oxygen can bind to hemoglobin, okay? So that's an important... The Bohr effect is telling you that if you vary pH, carbon dioxide levels, temperature, or what's called DPG, you're going to shift that curve to the right, which lowers the affinity for oxygen, and it facilitates the unloading of oxygen at the side of the tissue. The example that I always think about when I think about this curve is exercise. Think about what happens at the side of the tissue when you exercise. You increase temperature, you increase carbon dioxide, you increase lactic acid, so you increase the acidity in that area. That all shifts that curve to the right, facilitating the unloading of oxygen at, at the tissue. So take a look at what happens, say, in the veins at 40 millimeters of mercury. Just <laughs> go up, go all the way up to the first curve that you see. You see at 60%, that is the lowest acidic blood, right? That's the most acidic, lowest pH. 60% is saturated. So it's basically unloaded more oxygen then pH is 7.4 or pH is 7.6. So again, it facilitates the unloading of oxygen. What that means is it is lowering the affinity 
So a hemoglobin molecule now has a lower affinity for oxygen and it unloads it easier at the side of the tissue. How does that affect its affinity at the lungs? At the lungs? That's a great question. So at the lungs, you can see the curve is pretty tight. It doesn't, yeah, see how it's pretty tight at, the, at 100 millimeters of mercury here? It doesn't, you would think, yeah, you would think that it would also hamper the ability to bind oxygen at the lungs. But you can see here from the graph that it really doesn't have that much of an effect. So the effect really is on this part of the curve. Now, we didn't really talk about it in this class, but I know in like biochemistry, you guys cover this. The reason why this curve is S-shaped is because of cooperativity, right? Once you unload once one of the oxygen molecules, there's four oxygen molecules that can bind to hemoglobin. Once you unload one, you basically promote all of the other ones to release. Once you attach one, it actually promotes all of the other binding sites to attach oxygen. So it's called cooperativity. That's why it's a S-shaped curve. Okay, but looking at this curve, you can see that it's going to have more effects on unloading than it is on loading. Yeah, great question. Okay, so the Bohr effect is low pH is going to shift the curve to the right. Higher carbon dioxide levels is going to shift the curve to the right. Higher temperature is going to shift the curve to the right. Okay. Um, DPG is the other one. DPG is released by red blood cells in the face of high altitude and pregnancy. Makes sense. It's such a cool story to think about. When, when women are pregnant, they release DPG into their blood. That lowers their affinity for oxygen and promotes, and remember the fetus doesn't have the beta globin. So they hang on to that oxygen much, much tighter so that they don't compete for oxygen. It's just simply transferred from the mother's hemoglobin to the fetal hemoglobin. So remember, adults, mom's going to have two alpha, two beta. DPG is going to bind to the beta. Fetal hemoglobin has two alpha, two gamma, and DPG can't bind to it. So pretty cool. I like that story. OK. There are a couple of questions on the Bohr effect. So, but if you know those things, you'll be just fine. Um, let me look at the root effect here. Root effect. Okay, this is to your question. The root effect is when you actually lower the oxygen carrying capacity. Now in eels, when you increase acidity, not only do you get a shift to the right, but you can see the saturation point is significantly lower. So this is actually lowering the oxygen carrying capacity, which is called the root effect. So for you, when we, if you actually increase the number of hemoglobin, like you said, you're going to increase the saturation level, right? So this is not percentage. This is what I was talking about before. This is actually oxygen carrying capacity. Okay. So that saturation point would rise as a result. That so this is telling you something about oxygen carrying capacity. So what was the example we used in class on Monday? Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is going to lower the oxygen carrying capacity. What's another example? Anemia. If you cut your hemoglobin levels in half, you're going to lower the saturation point because you don't have the oxygen carrying capacity. Okay? Okay. The Haldane effect is telling you something about carbon dioxide levels. You can carry way, way more carbon dioxide in fully deoxygenated blood. So if there's no oxygen around, you can carry more carbon dioxide. Anybody remember um, 
how carbon dioxide is transported from the tissue back to the lungs primarily? What's that? Bicarbonate. bicarbonate. Plasma bicarbonate. Okay? Plasma bicarbonate. So the Haldane effect says that you can carry more carbon dioxide in deoxygenated blood. And just like the, pre the uh, practice exam, I would know both of these called hamburger effect or the chloride shift. Okay? Chloride shift. So carbon dioxide is produced by the tissue. It's basically transported into the red blood cells where the reaction goes in one direction. It goes from carbon dioxide and water is uh, converted by carbonic anhydrase to carbonic acid. It's then uh, converted to bicarbonate and protons. Some carbon dioxide actually binds to hemoglobin. Some of the hydrogen ions bind to hemoglobin. But predominantly, all of that bicarbonate is transported out of the red blood cell. And that's, where, that's how most of the carbon dioxide is transported from the tissue to the lungs in the form 70% in the form of plasma bicarbonate. Okay, so that bicarbonate ends up in the plasma, and that's what's transported back to the lungs. So you can see that the reaction is going primarily in just this direction. At the lungs, now the reaction goes in the opposite direction. Okay, so as carbon dioxide is, uh, diffuses into the lungs, it lowers this carbon dioxide, um, lowering carbonic acid and the amount of bicarbonate, that's going to promote basically the transport of bicarbonate into the cell and the reaction will continue in the opposite direction. It's actually a very elegant system, okay? So I would really take a hard look at both of these just like in the practice exam, okay? One other thing are those peripheral and chemoreceptors. There are a couple of questions on these two. Now, here's the key. I'm glad you guys are here today. The peripheral chemoreceptors are detecting partial pressure of oxygen, which is dissolved oxygen. It's the soluble oxygen. So the problem with carbon monoxide is that it was affecting hemoglobin. Partial pressure of oxygen and carbon dioxide are normal. That's why you didn't trigger uh, hyperventilation. Does that make sense to you guys? Those peripheral chemoreceptors are detecting partial pressure of oxygen, partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Okay. And they're also detecting hydrogen ions. Now, the funny thing about these peripheral chemoreceptors is that they are very sensitive to changes in carbon dioxide. Uh, we were talking about free diving after class last night, right? Free divers, when, they st when they're holding their breath underwater and they are accumulating carbon dioxide, they have this profound urge to take in a breath, right, because of these peripheral chemoreceptors. So, right, these chemoreceptors are detecting partial pressure of carbon dioxide, very sensitive to carbon dioxide, not so sensitive to partial pressure of oxygen, which is weird. You have to go to very, very low levels of oxygen, partial pressure of oxygen, to trigger hyperventilation. Kind of weird. I think that's weird. Um, okay, the central chemoreceptors, they're detecting carbon dioxide, but indirectly. They're actually detecting hydrogen ion concentration in the brain. So the difference between peripheral chemoreceptors, this is in the carotid and aortic arch. The chemoreceptors in the brain are called central chemoreceptors. Any questions about that, you guys? I think that's pretty much it.
right on time, 6.30. Woo! That's a lot of information. I'll stick around for a little bit if you guys want to answer questions. I'm going to start processing the uh, YouTube video right now. Hopefully I can get that out within a couple hours. So I will see you all tomorrow.